News Talk ZB, the home of news in 2015. New Zealand's number one radio station. And how much of Abbott's problem is Abbott? People don't like him in the rover. And dropping thousands of Western bombs will never, ever bring peace. If you were to take it to its literal conclusion, it would mean, I guess, that Napui would take back their lands and more or less ring fence themselves from the rest of New Zealand. Brace yourself. What will the new year bring? Breaking the stories. Unpacking the issues. Analyzing the impact. This is News Talk ZB. Dr. Stephen Meyer published a book called Signature in the Cell, DNA and the Evidence for Intelligent Design in 2009. It achieved some recognition. In fact, it was the Times Literary Supplement Book of the Year, which is a high honour indeed. Prestigious um, publication, the Times Literary Supplement. He's followed that with Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design, Dr. Stephen Meyer, good morning. Good morning. It's nice to be with you. And a pleasure to have you. And I'm going to be very intrigued with what you have to, uh, what, what you have to say. I read a quote off the, off the book earlier in the morning. This is from um, a paleontologist at Mount Holyoke College and the author of a book called The Emergence of Animals, referring to your book as a game changer for the study of evolution and points us in the right direction as we seek a new theory for the origin of animals. That would indicate to anybody who was, um, shall we say, not informed in this area, for instance, me, that would indicate that your book suggests that, um, that um, Darwin was wrong and Darwinian theory is obsolete. I, I, actually, I think that's correct. The, the modern textbook version of uh, Darwinian theory that we all learn in, uh, in school and in colleges and universities is known as neo-Darwinism. It's the, uh, it's the, the theory that combines the Darwinian idea of natural selection with the, uh, with the um, recognition that mutations are the, the key driving force in evolutionary uh, change. That theory is being increasingly rejected, not just by biologists generally, but, but by leading evolutionary theorists. And one of the things that I do in the book is describe the disparity that we have between the public presentation of the status of Darwinian theory by, by you know, known popularizers like Richard Dawkins or Bill Nye, the science guy in our country, or many, many, many other uh, spokesmen for, for official science. And the actual status of the theory, as we find it, when you get into the technical peer-reviewed literature in evolutionary theory, and one of the ways I show that in the book is I actually examine the many new theories of evolution that are being proposed to try to compensate for the lack of creative power of the, of the mutation natural selection mechanism. What the uh, paleontologist says for earlier in his quote, new data acquired in recent years instead of solving Darwin's dilemma have rather made it worse. How have they made it worse? Well, the Darwin's dilemma, or what I call Darwin's doubt in, in the book, refers to an event, a major event in the history of life known as the Cambrian Explosion. And it's the, the event in which the, the first major groups of animal forms arise in the fossil record. And these forms would uh, exemplify new, what are called body plans, u- unique ways of arranging body, body parts and, and uh, tissues. And uh, the, the big problem the Cambrian Explosion exposes is the problem of building new new forms of animal life. How is that done? The problem with the, the Cambrian event and, and others like it is that the fossil record documents that th- th- this event occurs very abruptly in the fossil record. Uh, Darwin expected that evolutionary change should take place very gradually as natural selection acted on these very small, minute variations, and therefore it would take a lot of time. But the major innovations in the history of life occur very suddenly or very abruptly, geologically speaking, and, they've, the, and so the paleontological evidence simply doesn't match what Darwinian theory expects. What have you got in common? What does your approach have in common with those neo Darwinians. Well, we think natural selection and random mutation, the standard mechanism, does a really good job of explaining minor, uh, small-scale variation. And most of the examples of the, the mechanism in action that you find in the textbooks are precisely of that kind of change. The Galapagos finches, whose beaks get bigger or smaller in response to varying uh, weather patterns. The peppered moths in England, uh, the, the, where the, 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 the coloration turned dark and light and dark again in response to varying levels of pollution, that sort of thing. So so the the and in fact one of the leading evolutionary biologists has uh, has said recently that um, that uh, neo-Darwinism does a good job of explaining the survival 
but not the arrival of the fittest. It explains minor small-scale adaptation, but not the origin of major new uh, forms and structures in, in, the, in the history of life. So let's be blunt. Um, talking, talking about um, um, intelligent design, are you, is, is that really a, just a, a front for God? Uh, the uh, we're often called creationists and cheap tuxedos and ID idiots and things like this, but there, there's a really important distinction. The theory of intelligent design is based on scientific evidence, uh, in particular the evidence of the functional digital code that has been discovered inside cells, inside the DNA molecule, which is so important to building animals. Um, we know from experience that uh, in, that it takes a, a programmer to make a computer program. It takes a, a mind or an intelligence generally to generate information. And so when we find information at the foundation of life, there is very solid evidence, a decisive evidence, I argue, in the book that a designing mind played a role in the history of life. Now, that's a conclusion that's based on an examination of the biology, based on an, an examination of the information-bearing properties of the key biomolecules. But uh, once you've concluded that there's a designing intelligence, it does raise a second-order philosophical question about the identity of the designer. And there are different opinions about that. I happen to be a traditional theist, but there are other proponents of intelligent design who hold different views. When you say that you're a traditional theist, you believe in God. I do. I believe in God. So I, I, Did you always? Um, I had a long period of uh, uh, existential angst through my university years, and it wasn't really till I was uh, finished with the uh, first couple of years out of school that I, I started to feel settled in my, uh, in fact, Christian beliefs. Do your Christian beliefs then get rejected by those neo-Darwinians? Oh, many, of course, because for... But I, no, yeah. sorry, let me rephrase yeah. the question. I want to take it further than that. Do your, do your scientific theories get eliminated before inspection because, because of... Because I have Christian yes. beliefs. Yeah, I, I, of, of course, there are people who want to decide the truth of a theory based on the profile of the person arguing for the theory. But that, that's a, a, a fallacy in informal logic. Uh, the, the key point is that the case for intelligent design is not based on a religious premise. It's, it's not based on uh, scripture or church tradition. Uh, or even the, the assumption of uh, the existence of a deity. It's based on the evidence that's been revealed in biology, the nanotechnology, the, the circuitry, the information processing systems, the digital code, the, the, the extraordinary complexity that we're discovering inside living organisms and inside cells. And it's ironically, and this is one of the things I show in the book, it's based on a standard method of scientific reasoning. In fact, the very method that Charles Darwin used. I, I, base my, I, I develop my case for intelligence intelligent design using an, an historical scientific method that Darwin pioneered, and I just come to a different conclusion, in part because things have been discovered that Darwin didn't know about. Um, he wrote before Watson and Crick and didn't know anything about the information revolution in biology. Well, I mentioned Watson and Crick um, earlier this morning in a, in a reference to the book, but you better allude to them. Uh, well, Watson and Crick uh, uh, elucidated the structure of DNA in 1953, and uh, I think Perhaps even more importantly, in 1957, Francis Crick, uh, working on his own, developed what he called the sequence hypothesis, in which he proposed that uh, four crucial chemicals that run along the interior of the DNA molecule function like alphabetic characters in a written text or digital characters in uh, like zeros and ones in a section of machine code or computer code. That is to say, the arrangement of these chemicals along the spine of the DNA literally store information for directing the construction of the proteins and protein machines that cells need to stay alive. So we have, we have digital information directing the construction of essentially mechanical parts. It's much like the technology that we use today in manufacturing called CAD-CAM, Computer Assisted Design and Manufacturing. So there's a, there's a form of informational high technology at the foundation of life, and it's the, the kind of technology that we recognize because of what we know intelligent agents, intelligent designers in our own experience build. And so it's, it's really quite striking. The computer people see this. And, well, of course, and, you, get confronted with, uh, you get confronted with challenges. And if you're going to talk about um, a creative designer under, under whatever name you want to give that creative designer, uh, the question is, and I have one here, who designed the designer? 
Well, um, I, I addressed that in Chapter 17 of Signature in the Cell. It's a, it's a, uh, a standard objection from Richard Dawkins. And the, the question can actually be turned around because Dawkins thinks that undirected, unguided processes produced everything. And the question is, where did those unguided, undirected processes come from? You can always ask a prior question. Yes. And I, I think this, this question actually goes back to the issue of cosmology. Every worldview or system of thought has to answer the, 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 the fundamental question. What is the thing or the entity from which everything else came? And there are two great possibilities, and they've been debated back to the ancient Greeks. One, one idea is that matter came first and uh, organized itself by purely material processes and produced everything that we see around us. Uh, the other view is that, the, that we're, it was a mind first uh, view where mind shaped matter and, and, and provided design in that manner. Um, so the, the big question is not um, what came first, or, you know, everybody has a, a can, is, everyone's system of thought is subject to that same question. Well, who, what came before that? What, what, what mm. produced that? But the, the real question is, what is the best entity, the most likely entity, based on what we know scientifically, to be that thing from which everything else comes? Um, and I think in light of modern cosmology, m matter and energy is not a good candidate to be what philosophers call the primitive, the thing from which everything else comes, me, because we know there was a definite beginning to the universe itself. Let me give me an answer to this just, just briefly for the moment, if, sure. you, if you would. I've, I've said many times, because I just came to this conclusion, and I'm possibly quite wrong, but if you, uh, and they say that Stephen Hawking has, has at least made progress in answering this, this question, if you sat and thought about it and tried to come to an answer, a conclusion about infinity and about where things came from in the first place, you could send yourself to the nut house. Is, is there any... Yeah, I think that's absolutely, absolutely right. There's, there's a limit to human reason. There are certain types of, of questions that we can't answer. Hawking has highlighted one. He's, he's pointed out that the universe is expanding and that space is expanding as the expansion goes. But that means the space is expanding into something that's not, not spatial, and it's almost impossible to conceive what that entity is. I mean, we, it, it does drive you to the nuthouse.